a few weeks ago I was listening to a spiritual uh, that I hadn't heard for a while. Bones, them dry bones, I think bones, them dry bones, or something like that. Anyway, I thought that would be a good sermon topic. And it uh, goes back to the time of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest. He was a prophet during the darkest days of, Earth, of, of Judah's history. And it's almost probably impossible for us to imagine the conditions of Jerusalem when they under, under siege, the horrors of mass starvation and the suffering caused by the displacement of the entire nation. The destruction of Jerusalem at the beginning of the 6th century was a product of a process that began 300 years earlier with King Solomon. With few exceptions, from the time of Solomon onward, it was downhill. You remember the kingdom was divided into two sections, the northern ten tribes and the southern tribes of Judah. And uh, ever since Jeroboam built two golden calves and set them up in Bethel and Dan, the people, so the people wouldn't go down to Jerusalem, the history of the northern kingdom declined until they were destroyed by Assyria in the time of Isaiah. This was the product of sin. We don't use the word much anymore. That's sin implies. I mean, we, we're we're messed up and we got problems. We all know that. But sin is not a modern word because, well, it's kind of judgmental, and that's about the worst thing you can be today. Uh, it, it implies some kind of moral absolutes, and in our society, that that just doesn't go. We were talking to Allison this morning. She's taking a college out there in, in philosophy and. And she tells us sometimes about the, the ideas they talk about. And judgmental is the worst thing you can be today. You can have any other value, practice, behavior you want, but don't be judgmental about it. And so that's one of the reasons Christianity, maybe the reason why Christianity is not appreciated by many in our world. Because this little subject called sin implies a moral absolute. And people take it so lightly and it's easy to brush off God's law as ar archaic. And, you know, today the modern man is educated. We're mature enough to make our own choices. Anyway, society de degenerates until it is normal and they bypass God's law. But the principle goes back to Deuteronomy. There are consequences to this. And in, in Deuteronomy... 3119, Moses is summarizing his paper on, you know, the blessings and curses. If you do my will, if you follow me, if you're obedient, you're going to prosper, and if you don't, you'll finally be destroyed. And he says, I call, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So they would prosper if they obeyed God. And for some reason, the human race can't get that point. There's just something we, we, we've never learned. And so the process has been repeated with every nation, every civilization, every people, and every church in the history of mankind. You know, in the, in, in the northern kingdom, in their the 300 years, there was not one good king. <laughs> they just kept getting worse. And the southern kingdom had one or two, two or three. And so finally it got so bad, Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians and they were taken into captivity into Babylon. Now at the time of the Babylonian captivity, there were three major prophets. Jeremiah was one that stayed in Jerusalem and preached to the remnant there. And Ezekiel and Daniel went to, they were captives in Babylon. Ezekiel was a teenager. And he had witnessed the siege of Jerusalem in 605. And the city was breached. Nebuchadnezzar set up his own government. He took a number of Hebrew youth captive, of which Ezekiel and Daniel were two of them. So I always wondered why Ezekiel wasn't mentioned in, in Daniel. Because, because he was there. 
And what's interesting, Israel, of course, didn't accept the government that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and so they continued to encourage the people to resist. And they, they said, God can't, this, this nation will never be destroyed. We are God's people. That can never change. There are no conditions to this. I think we should think about that sometimes, too. And so they, say, they, they, they kept telling him, let's, let's, let's align ourselves with Egypt and we, we can resist Babylon. And people believed clear to the end that God would rescue Jerusalem. Well, five years after Ezekiel was in exile, in 5, 592, he had his first vision. He was so overwhelmed by this vision as he sat in silence for seven days. <laughs> And here's what he was told to do. After he saw the vision, God said, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, a rebellious nation. Their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent, they are stubborn. As for them, whether they will hear or refuse, they're going to know a prophet was among them. It's kind of a disagreeable task. Ezekiel was told he must tell the people why all this happened. And it was a result of their own choices, their own behaviors. And they didn't want to hear what God... They didn't want to hear that it was God that turned them over to their enemies. And they knew God wasn't like that. Not a whole lot has changed. They continued to believe they were the chosen people of God and ignore the conditions that God had set up at the beginning. But people still believe their popular theologies that kind of overlook the conditions. So the prophets that God sent, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel, were not very popular. Ezekiel was told by God, you're, you're going to run into some fierce opposition. He said, Son of man, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid or dismayed by their looks. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse. And there was a little footnote added to that. If you don't tell them, what I tell you. You're going to be accountable for their rebellion. He says, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. When you say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and if you don't warn him, if you don't speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. If you do warn him, and he doesn't turn from his wicked way. He shall die, but you will deliver your soul. So he had to deliver this message, or he would bear the responsibility of not, not telling them. His message was, simp was simple. If you read through Ezekiel, you guys are in worse shape than the nations that you originally displaced in Palestine. But, and of course, they didn't believe it. They were conditioned by exposure to sin to think it was normal. Behaviors that they once thought were perverted, they, they accepted as, as normal. They were so corrupted that they probably wouldn't even be shocked by modern TV. <laughs> it isn't this difficult to understand how Israel could reach this condition because it's a, insidious. It's a cumulative process from one generation to generation. It progresses until the result is slavery. You know, this year we are being entertained by almost uninterrupted political hype. <laughs> Candidates are promising to make things better. And they blather on and on and on about restoring national greatness while the truth is that we have become a nation of drug in a drug-induced stupor and addicted to pornography. Now, the definition of pornography has changed in the last 60 years. It just keeps getting worse. 
and what is acceptable to kids would have considered been, uh, to have been pornography 50 years ago. Now it's, long, it's, it's been understood for a long time that the future isn't going to be bright when the nation is corrupted. You've heard of the name Machiavelli. 15th century political philosopher. He was the first analyst of power, and his name is often misused and misapplied to, you know, you've heard people being called Machiavellian. That's the idea that, that it refers to a ruthless, underhanded power monger. If you actually read his writings, <laughs> probably isn't done too often, you will notice that how many of his principles he gets from the Bible correctly. And that his goal for political power is that it had to be maintained and it was to be used for the good of the people. That was Machiavelli. The sense his writing, in his writings is that the principles that make a nation great, when a nation is founded, they were very high, highly disciplined, high principles behind it. But he notes that because of human nature, they tend to corrupt the power and turn to principles that will result in the loss of the nation. And, and he writes, here's an interesting idea. We should consider, he said, whether in a nation that has become corrupt, a free government that has existed there can be maintained. And he says, where corruption has penetrated the people, the best laws are of no avail unless they are administered by a man of such supreme power that he may cause the laws to be observed until the mass has been restored to a healthy condition. And I know not whether such a case has ever occurred in the history of the human race or whether it ever could occur. In other words, what he's saying is it reaches a certain level. You can't turn it around. And he wrote, he knew that corruption will result in the loss of freedom, and it would be interesting to speculate where we are in this process. You know, we are being invaded by a relentless enemy that is destabilizing the whole world. And we lock a lot of people up, but our prison system is not going to protect us. When the fear of God is lost, there is nothing left to control the heart of man. I've talked about this situation in Israel, because I think it compares to today quite easily. But that's what Ezekiel was sent to address. His job was to explain to Israel why they lost their freedom, why they lost their nation. And his message was, is you have no hope of regaining it until you do what God wants you to do. Now Ezekiel was in his early 20s by now. He started preaching. He tried to convince the exiles there's no hope of immediate uh, deliverance. You might as well put down your roots, start your businesses, Get established in Babylon because you're there because it's a judgment of God. And he wasn't believed for six years. And then Jerusalem was totally destroyed by the Babylonians. Exile, nothing left. And finally the captive, captives started paying attention. They knew that unless God intervened and things changed, there was no hope of returning and if they didn't return, they would just be simply swallowed up by the nations like everybody else had been. And finally, after the Jerusalem was totally destroyed, they started listening again. They think about what it took to get their attention. And when everything appeared to have been lost, God had their attention. And the message in Ezekiel starts to change now. And there's reasons for hope now given to Israel. For chapter 36 contains verses like, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you to your own land. 
Thus says the Lord, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will enable you to dwell in your cities and the ruins will be rebuilt. But before that could happen, they had to understand certain things, and that is they got to stop, stop worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. In other words, worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And so instead of depending on God as the author and as controller of nature, they started, they were worried about the forces of nature that he commands. There's amazing similarities between now and then. We dress it up in scientific terms, but nature worship, worship still has the same effect on people. Ezekiel was showing women sitting in the north gate of the temple weeping for Tammuz, a Sumerian god whose death and resurrection each year caused the seasons. And he was shown the inner sanctuary and shown the 25 men with their backs toward the temple and their faces towards the east, worshiping the sun. And you probably wonder, well, why would anybody do that? To us, it seems like kind of a useless thing. We've been conditioned by our society to think about nature as a benign force that we can harness for our technology. And so we're not too worried about nature anymore, although that may change. Because God is using nature to carry out His will. It says in Ministry of Healing that God is constantly employed in upholding and using as His servants the things that He has made. He works through the laws of nature, using them as his instruments. They are not self-acting. Nature in her work testifies to the intelligent presence and active agency of a being who moves in all things, moves all things according to his will. Ministry of Healing 415. Paganism is nature worship, but now it has a new form, but it teaches the same things. And so people worry about all the things going on in the world with, with the weather. You know, that's really a big topic. Just, and I, I, I'm, I'm really inspired by the people who forte forecast the weather. I don't care how many times they're wrong. They're just as enthusiastic and confident <laughs> as ever. But when the worship of God is given up, there's no ideals to reach for. And we are left to our own resources and we always de de become corrupt. It's interesting. You wonder how that could happen. I mean, Israel was, God's power over nature was demonstrated in the Exodus, their deliverance from slavery, from Egypt. They saw the, his care was demonstrated through the whole wilderness journey. You know, modern Israel is subject to the same temptations. And we might not be any more successful in dealing with them. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the ways in there are, are the ways of death. There's only one possible remedy for this mess. Ezekiel explained how it works. It was in Ezekiel that God promised to give us a new heart. He promised to give back their land, but they had to understand something. One of the most colorful chapters in the book is chapter 37, and it reveals how change can come to people. And it starts off and it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them and there were very many bones in the valley and indeed they were very dry. It means they've been dead for quite some time. They were quite dead. And he says that bones represent the house of Israel. Bones represent death. In other words, Israel was dead, virtually completely dead, not just because they were in captivity, but spiritually there was no sign of life whatsoever. The bones were dry. In fact, he says very dry. But they hadn't gone and stopped their temple rituals. They continued to practice these things. 
But there was no moisture, there was no spirit, there was no life. You know, Jesus represents himself as the water of life. It says in Revelation 22, 17, the bride and the spirit say, come. Let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So these valley of dry bones, and you can just picture them, very dry bones because they had not paid attention to what God told them for a long time. God sent them prophets to explain what was going on, but they either ignored them or killed them or both. And we're fortunate that it's not like that today. But people no longer ignore what God says. But Adventists are studying their Bibles to learn God's will. And the message is, is His word, His will is life. Period. Without it, there is no life. You cannot ignore a prophet of God and have spiritual life. I'll say it again. You cannot ignore a prophet of God and have life. You can imagine that you do. And there are lots of theologies out there that will tell you you do. But what we need, you're not going to get from the radio, the TV, the books, except the nation was dead because they didn't listen to God's word, to his prophets. And so God asked Ezekiel a question, son of man, can these dead bones live? Well, Ezekiel didn't see any hope for him. He didn't see any signs of life, so he answered... He, so so he, he answered, he says, Oh Lord, you know. And then God said to him, Preach to these bones. Preach to these bones and say, Oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Well, what good would that do? But the word of God is a source of life. The world was created by those words. By the power of God we are given existence. And by it we are sustained. And so God said to these bones, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So for these bones to live, they had to hear God's word. You know, and this is a statement that isn't too popular anymore, but Review and Herald, Ellen White actually wrote that no one can attain Christian perfection while neglecting the word of God. The Bible says the word of the Lord is powerful. But you've got to get it into our minds. Usually we, you know, usually we sit in our groups and I do the same thing. I mean, I'm not knocking you, but we have our intellectual exercises when we discuss the lesson or we start, re talk about the Bible. And, 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 and I think that's fun to do. And it, we, we, we've done it for many, many years. But those principles our life, they need to get into our minds. Its purpose is to raise our sights, purify the life, the, 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 the life. Well, will it work? Can these dry bones live? That was the question Ezekiel asked. Can, they, can these very dry bones live? Is it possible for us to escape the corruption of the world by, by a new life that God puts into the heart? This corruption that is destroying mankind is having quite a, a bit of influence on us. I think modern Christians are listening listen, to so many voices today. I mean, we've never been inundated with information as we are today. And 
it's just overwhelming. I mean, you know, you pick your favorite preacher or teacher or whatever, and some of them are good, some of them aren't. I'm not, it's not all bad. But I think if, there, if we're not reading the Bible, or we're reading it in such a hurried way that it's not getting into the, into the mind, it's not going to produce a whole lot. So Ezekiel was told to preach to these dry bones, and he said, so I, he said, he said, prophesied as I commanded, and I prophesied and there was noise. And suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Interesting sight. Makes you wonder, well, what, 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 what is a word? What can it do? What is God's word does? Well, what good does it do to stand up and preach? What does, good does it do to read the Bible? I mean, that's words. Words are power. Words are ideas. They're not just noise. But our minds, our world operates on ideas and we are paying a huge consequence for the ideas that are circulating in our world today. Our defense isn't in armies and things like that. It's in words. It's in ideas. If, if anything is going to change, something new needs to get into our minds. A new idea must get in there and take root. We might think, well, there's nothing new because God's word has been around a long time and What could it possibly do that it hasn't already done? But the Bible is always new. It's man's ideas that are old and worn out. The problems we read about with, with Jerusalem of old are just the same problems as we have today and you just hear them over and over again and if you listen to them enough they're just simply depressing. They have no solutions, no hope, no answers and the more we soak our minds with them the worse it looks. And the ideas that are ruling the world today are going to cause more suffering, more death. Well, actually, they already are. You look at what's going on in the Middle East right now. And you see the display. They say half of the nation of Syria is now displaced. Half the nation. Can you imagine living in the middle of that? You can't blame the people for trying to get out of there. How do they live? So the, what, what's causing that? Religions, ideas. There are people trying to change the world into their own model. And every time that's happened in history, it has resulted in incredible numbers of dead. But in God's word, there is power and there is life. And, he's, and Ezekiel was watching all this He's preaching to these dead bones. And I looked and the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them, and, but there was no breath. And so he said, preach to the breath and prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord, come, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. It has the power to produce life. If you're trying to do it on your own, you just can't. We need to flush out the garbage that has been put in there from years and years of exposure to this stuff. That is the result of listening and believing and following God's Word. That Word created life in the past, it, does it, it can do it again. Remember what the most frequently stated the free, the phrase in uh, Genesis chapter 1. And God said, and it was so. Just that simple. That was the real. So at the very beginning of time, a relationship was established between God's word and the reality, the physical reality that we think is reality. And the idea there is, so when God speaks, we should listen. And it will do for us the same thing that it did for them. He knows what he's talking about. We can't reach beyond our own imaginations which got, got us into this mess to begin with. 
And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on, stood on their feet. And it says, they were an exceedingly great army. Well, we need a great army of living people, of people who have life, something that is seen and witnessed. How's that going to happen? It's going to be done by listening to and believing in God's word. He said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Israel, and they, say, and they say, they even knew it, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. They felt hopeless, they felt weak, they felt powerless. They had given up. And God is demonstrating that he can revive it and make it great. We can do what God has given us to do. We need to get that into our heads. There is nothing that he has asked us to do that with his help we cannot do. But we have to make some important choices. And it begins with what we put into our minds. We can choose power and life. Or we can tune into what this world is churning out and it will destroy us. It's that simple. We need to stop listening to man's worn out ideas because we can't see beyond our own nose. And look beyond and consider the possibilities and look at the history of what God has done. Start believing he's going to do it again and put it into practice. Ezekiel 37, 12, thus says the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. That's what he wants to do again. And he says, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, has spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Amen. It's time for this to happen again. None of it will be done by man's power. Not his brilliance, not his ideas. It's all God's. We can listen, or we can refuse to listen. That is our choice. Let's sing the closing hymn. Actually, it's kind of a little chorus I'd like to use for a few weeks. I don't know if you know it. Uh, but let's give it a try. It's in 659, May the Grace of Christ Our Savior. I picked it for the words. Actually, it's a pretty song, too. And uh, maybe it'll be on the screen. <laughs> okay, it will. 659 in your hymnal. Please, please stand. God of, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.